down the rabbit hole. By Lewis Carroll. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering, in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chair would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that. Nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. When she thought it over afterwards, it occurred to her that she ought to have wondered at this. But at the time, it all seemed quite natural. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it, and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet. It flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it. And burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it. It was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way, and then dipped suddenly down. So suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep, or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her, and to wonder what was going to happen next. First she tried to look down and make out what she was coming to, but it was too dark to see anything. Then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed. It was labelled Orange Marmalade. But to her great disappointment, it was empty. She did not like to drop the jar for fear of killing somebody underneath, so managed to put it into one of the cupboards as she fell past. Well, thought Alice to herself, after such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. How brave they'll all think me at home! Why, I wouldn't say anything about it, even if I fell off the top of the house. Which was very likely true. Down, down, down. Did the fall never come to an end? I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the centre of the earth. Let me see. That would be 4,000 miles down, I think. For you see, Alice had learned several things of this sort in her lessons in the schoolroom, and though this was not a very good opportunity for showing off her knowledge, as there was no one to listen to her, still it was good practice to say it over. Yes, that's about the right distance. But then I wonder what latitude or longitude I've got to. Alice had not the slightest idea what latitude was, or longitude either, but she thought they were nice grand words to say. Presently she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downward. The antipathies, I think. She was rather glad there was no one listening this time, as it didn't sound at all the right word. But I shall have to ask them what the name of the country is, you know. Please, Mum, is this New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as she spoke. Fancy curtsying as you're falling through the air. 
Do you think you could manage it? And what an ignorant little girl she'll think me for asking. No, it'll never do to ask. Perhaps I shall see it written up somewhere. Down, down, down. There was nothing else to do. So Alice soon began talking again. Dino and the snake very much tonight, I should think. Dino is the cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time.
はキツネかタヌキだろうやっぱり役者だが数年以前のこと今の沢村総十郎氏の門弟で何がしという男はある夏の晩よそからの帰りがだいぶ遅くなったので折り詰めを片手にしながらテクテク馬道の通りを急いでやってきてさて商店下の今戸橋のところまで来ると辺りは一面の出水でもはやどうすることもできない車やと思ったが辺りには人の影もない橋の上も一尺ばかり水が出て落水がゴーゴーという音を立てて隅田川の方へ流れ込んでいる仕方がないので着物の裾を思うさままくり合えて何しろこの急流ゆえ流されては一大事と犬のように四つん這いになって折れ爪は口に加えながら無我夢中一生懸命になって危ない危ないと自分で叫びながらようやく向こうの橋爪まで来るとそこに白い着物を着た男が一人立っていて盛んに笑っているのだおかしなやつだと思ってふと見ると交番署の前に立っていた巡査だ巡査は笑いながら「一体今何をしていたのか?」と聞くから「何しろこんな出水で到底渡れないからこうしてきたのだ」と言いながらふと後ろを振り返ってみると出水どころか道もカラカラに乾いて橋の上もいつもと少しも変わりがない「おやこいつは一番やられたわい」と手にした折り爪を見ると怖いかにそこは水しか取れてうちはガランガランついに大笑いをしてそれからまた師匠のうちへ帰っても盛んにみんなから笑われたとのことだ
I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I sleep my liver in the sea. However, I know nothing at all about my disease. I do not know for certain what ails me. I know to consult a doctor for it. I never have, so I have a respect for medicine and doctors. Besides, I have a supreme superstition. Submission is over respect medicine. Any day, I am well educated and no doctor. Let it get worse. I have been going on like that for a long time, 20 years. Now I am 40. I used to be in the government service, but I'm no longer. I was a spiteful official. I was rude, and took pleasure in being so. I did not take bribes, you see, so I was bound to find the recompense of that, at least. A poor jest, but I will not scratch it out. I wrote it thinking it would sound very witty, but now that I have seen myself, that I only wanted to show off in a despicable way, I will not scratch it out on purpose. When petitioners used to come for information to the table at which I sat, I used to grind my teeth at them, and felt intense enjoyment. When I succeeded in making anybody unhappy, I almost did succeed. For the most part they were all timid people, of course, they were petitioners. But of the official ones there was one officer in particular I could not endure. He simply would not be humble, but clanked his sword in a disgusting way. I carried on the feud with him for 18 months over that sword. At last I got the better of him. He left off for clanking his. That happened in my youth, though. But do you know, gentlemen, what was the chief point about my spy? Why, the whole point, the real stake of it lay in the fact that continually, even in the moment of the acutest spleen, I was inwardly conscious with shame that I was not only not a spiteful, but not even as a bitter man, that I was simply scaring sparrows at random and amusing myself by it. I might throw with the mouth, but bring me a doll to play with, give me a cup of tea with sugar in it, and maybe I should be appeased. I might even be genuinely touched, though probably I should grind my teeth at myself afterwards and lie awake at night with shame for months after. That was my way. I was lying when I said just now that I was a spiteful official. I was lying from spite. I was simply amusing myself with the petitioner and with the officer, and in reality I never could become spiteful. I was conscious every moment in myself of many, very many elements absolutely opposite to that. I felt them positively swarming in me, these opposite elements. I knew that they had been swarming in me all my life and craving some uplift from me, but I would not let them, would not let them, purposely would not let them come out. They tormented me till I was ashamed. They drove me to convulsions and sickened me, but last, how they sickened me. Now, are not you fancying, gentlemen? I am expressing remorse for something now that I am asking your forgiveness for something. I am sure you are fancy and that. However, I assure you I do not care if you are. It was not only that I could not become spiteful, I did not know how to become anything. Either spiteful or kind, either a rascal or an honest man, either a hero or an insect. Now, I am living out my life in my corner, taunting myself with the spiteful and useless consolation that an intelligent man cannot become anything seriously, but it is only the fool who becomes anything. Yes, a man in the 19th century must, and morally ought to be preeminently a characterless creature. A man of character, an active man is preeminently a limited creature. That is my conviction of 40 years. I am 40 years old now, and you know 40 years is a whole lifetime, you know it is extreme old age. To live longer than 40 years is bad manners, is vulgar, immoral. Who does live beyond 40? Answer that, sincerely and honestly I will tell you who do. Fools and worthless fellows. I tell all old men, that to their face, all these venerable old men, all these silver-haired and reverend seniors, I tell the whole world that to its face.
tell me this. Why does it happen that at the very, yes, at the very moments, when I am most capable of feeling every refinement of all that is sublime and beautiful, as they used to say at one time, it would, as though of design, happen to me not only to feel, but to do such ugly things, such that, well, in short, actions that all, perhaps, commit, but which, as though purposely, occurred to me at the very time, when I was most conscious, that they ought not to be committed. The more conscious I was of goodness, and of all that was sublime and beautiful, the more deeply I sank into my mire, and the more ready I was to sink in it altogether. But the chief point was that all this was, as it were, not accidental in me, but as though it were bound to be so. It was as though it were my most normal condition, but not in the least disease or depravity, so that at last all desire in me to struggle against this depravity passed. It ended by my almost believing, perhaps actually believing, that this was perhaps my normal condition. But at first, in the beginning, what agonies I endured in that struggle. I did not believe it was the same with other people, and all my life I hid this fact about myself as a secret. I was ashamed, even now, perhaps, I am ashamed. I got to the point of feeling a sort of secret abnormal, despicable enjoyment in returning home to my corner on some disgusting Petersburg night, acutely conscious that that day I had committed a loathsome action again, that what was done, could never be undone, and secretly, and gnawing, gnawing at myself for it, tearing and consuming myself till at last the bitterness turned into a sort of shameful and cursed sweetness, and at last, into positive real enjoyment, yes, into enjoyment, into enjoyment, I insist upon that, I have spoken of this, because I keep wanting, to know for a fact, whether other people feel such enjoyment, I will explain, the enjoyment was just from the two intense consciousness of one's own degradation, it was from feeling oneself that one had reached the last barrier, that it was horrible, but that it could not be otherwise, that there was no escape for you, that you never could become a different man, that even if time was made for still left you to change into something different, you would most likely not wish to change, or if you did wish to, even then you would do nothing, because perhaps in reality there was nothing for you to change into, and the worst of it was, at the root of it all, that it was all in accord with the normal fundamental laws of overhead consciousness, and with the inertia that was the direct result of those laws, and that consequently one was not only unable to change, but would do absolutely nothing, thus it would follow, as the result of a true consciousness, that 
probably about it as judges and arbitrators, laughing at it till their melody sides age. Of course the only thing left for it is to dismiss all that with a wave of its paw, and, with a style of assumed contempt in which it does not even itself believe, to remix ominiously into its household. There is its nasty, stinking, underground home for insulted, crushed and ridiculed house promptly becomes absorbed in cold, malignant, and, above all, everlasting spite. For 40 years together it will remember its injury down to the smallest, most ignominious details, and every time will add, of itself, the tale still more ignominious, spitefully teasing and tormenting itself with its own imagination. So on, and so on. Merciful heavens. Flowers before him, sing and cry Hosanna. It is he, it is he, all repeat. It must be he, it can be no one but him. He stops at the steps of the Seville Cathedral at the moment when the weeping mourners are bringing in a little open white coffin. In it lies a child of seven, the only daughter of a prominent citizen. 
the dead child lies hidden in flowers. He will raise your child, the crowd shouts to the weeping mother. The priest, coming to meet the coffin, looks perplexed and frowns. But the mother of the dead child throws herself at his feet with a wail. If it is thou, raise my child, she cries, holding out her hands to him. The procession halts, and the coffin is laid on the steps at his feet. He looks with compassion, and his lips once more softly pronounce, Maiden, arise. The little girl sits up in the coffin and looks round, smiling with wide open, wondering eyes, holding a bunch of white roses they had put in her hand. There are cries, sobs, confusion among the people. And at that moment, the Cardinal himself, the Grand Inquisitor, passes by the cathedral. He is an old man, almost ninety, tall and erect, with a withered face sunken eyes in which there is still a gleam of light. He is not dressed in his gorgeous cardinal's robes as he was the day before, when he was burning the enemies of the Roman church. At this moment he is wearing his coarse old monk's cassock. At a distance behind him come his gloomy assistants and slaves of the holy God. He stops at the sight of the crowd and watches it from a distance. He sees everything. He sees them set the coffin down at his feet, sees the child rise up, his face dark. He knits his thick grey brows and his eyes gleam with a sinister fire. He holds out his finger and bids the guards take him. And such is his power, so completely are the people cowed in submission and trembling obedience to him, that the crowd immediately makes way for the guards, and in the midst of death-like silence, they lay hands on him and lead him. The crowd instantly bows down to the earth like one man before the old inquisitor. He blesses the people in silence and passes on. The guards lead their prisoner to the close, gloomy vault of prison in the ancient palace of the Holy Inquisition. Shut him in. The day passes and is followed by the dark. The air is fragrant with lore and leather. In the pitch darkness, the iron door of the prison is suddenly opened, and the Grand Inquisitor himself comes in with the light of his hand. He is alone. The door is closed at once behind him. He stands in the doorway, and for a minute or two gazes into his face. At last, he goes up slowly, sets the light on the table, and speaks. Is it thou? Thou, but receiving no answer, he adds at once, Don't answer, be silent. What canst thou say indeed? I know too well what thou wouldst say, and thou hast no right to add anything to what thou hast said of old. Why then art thou come to hinder us? For thou hast come to hinder us, and thou knowest that. But dost thou know what will be tomorrow? I know not who thou art and care not to know whether it is thou or only a semblance of him. But tomorrow I shall condemn thee and burn thee at the stake as the worst of heretics. And the very people who have today kissed thy feet, tomorrow at the faintest sign from me will rush to heap up the embers of thy fire. Knowest thou that? Yes, maybe thou knowest it here. Never for a moment taking his eyes off the prisoner. I don't quite understand, Ivan. What does it mean? Alyosha, who had been listening in silence, said with a smile. Is it simply a wild fantasy or, or a mistake on the part of the old man? Some impossible quid pro quo? Make it as the last, said Ivan, laughing. If you are so corrupted by modern realism and can't stand anything fantastic, if you like it to be a case of mistaken identity, let it be so. It is true, he went on laughing, the old man was 90, and he might well be crazy over his set idea. He might have been struck by the appearance of the prisoner. It might in fact be simply his ravings, the delusion of an old man of 90, overexcited by the auto de fe of a hundred heretics the day before. 
Does it matter to us, after all, whether it was a mistake of identity or a wild fantasy? All that matters is that the old man should speak out, that he should speak openly of what he has thought in silence for 90 years. And the prisoner, too, is silent. Does he look at him and not say a word? That's inevitable in any case. Ivan laughed again. The old man has told him he hasn't the right to add anything to what he has said of old. One may say it's the most fundamental feature of Roman Catholicism, in my opinion at least. All has been given by thee to the Pope, they said, and all, therefore, is still in the Pope's hands, and there is no need for thee to come now at all. Thou must not meddle, for the time at least. That's how they speak, and right to the Jesuits, at any rate. I've read it myself in the works of their theologians. Hast thou the right to reveal to us one of the mysteries of that world from which thou hast come? My old man asks him, and answers the question for him. No, thou hast not. That thou mayest not add to what has been said of old, and mayest not take from men the freedom which thou didst exalt when thou wast on earth. Whatsoever thou revealest anew will encroach on men's freedom of faith, for it will be manifest as a miracle, and the freedom of their faith was dearer to thee than anything in those days fifteen hundred years ago. Didst thou not often say then, I will make you free? But now thou hast seen these free men, the old man adds suddenly with a pensive smile. Yes, we paid dearly for it, he goes on, looking sternly at me. But at last we have completed that work in thy name. For fifteen centuries we have been wrestling with thy freedom. But now it is ended and over for good. Dost thou not believe that it's over for good? Thou lookest meekly at me and deignest not even to be wroth with me. But let me tell thee that now, today, people are more persuaded than ever that they have perfect freedom. Yet they have brought their freedom to us and laid it humbly at our feet. But that has been our doing. Was this what thou didst? Was this thy freedom? Why have I been longing for you? Why have I been thirsting for you all these days and just now? It's five days since I've cast anchor here. Because it's only to you I can tell everything. Because I must. Because I need you. Because tomorrow I shall fly from the clouds. Because tomorrow life is ending and beginning. Have you ever felt? Have you ever dreamt of falling down a precipice into a pit? That's just how I'm falling, but not in a dream. And I'm not afraid. And don't you be afraid. At least, I am afraid, but I enjoy it. It's not enjoyment, though, but ecstasy. Damn it all, whatever it is, a strong spirit, a weak spirit, a womanish spirit, whatever it is, let us praise nature. You see what sunshine, how clear the sky is. The leaves are all green. It's still summer. Four o'clock in the afternoon, and the stillness. Where were you going? I was going to Father's, but I meant to go to Katerina Ivanovna's first. To her? And to Father? Huh, what a coincidence! Why was I waiting for you? Hungering and thirsting for you in every cranny of my soul and even in my ribs? Why, to send you to Father and to her, Katerina Ivanovna, so as to have done with her and with Father. To send an angel. I might have sent anyone. But I wanted to send an angel. And here you are, on your way to see father and her. Did you really mean to send me? cried Alyosha with a distressed expression. Stay! You knew it, and I see you understand it all at once. But be quiet! Be quiet for a time. Don't be sorry and don't cry. Dmitri stood up, thought a moment, and put his finger to his forehead. She's asked you, written to you a letter or something. That's why you're going to her. You wouldn't be going except for that. Here is her note. Alyosha took it out of his pocket. Mitya looked through it quickly. And you were going the back way. Oh, gods, I thank you for sending him by the back way. And he came to me like the golden fish to the silly old fisherman in the fable. Listen, Alyosha. Listen, brother. Now I mean to tell you everything. For I must tell someone. An angel in heaven I have told already, but I want to tell an angel on earth. You are an angel on earth. You will hear and judge and forgive. And that 
that's what I need, that someone above me should forgive. Listen, if two people break away from everything on earth and fly off into the unknown, or at least one of them, and before flying off or going to ruin, he comes to someone else and says, do this for me. Some favor never asked before, that could only be asked on one's deathbed. Would that other refuse, if you were a friend or a brother? I will do it, but tell me what it is, and make haste, said Alyosha. Make haste. <laughs> Don't be in a hurry, Alyosha, you worry and worry yourself. There's no need to hurry now. Now the world has taken a new turn. Ah, Alyosha, what a pity you can't understand saying to you, as though you didn't understand it. What an ass I am. What am I saying? Be noble, oh man. Who says that? Alyosha made up his mind to wait. He felt that perhaps, indeed, his work lay here. Mitya sank into thought for a moment, with his elbow on the table and his head in his hand. Both were silent. It was the fear of
lips to ear of tankard one. Mr. Dollar, did oh, Dollar, murmured tankard. Tank one, believe. Miss Ken, would she? That doll he was. She doll. The tank. He murmured that he knew the name. The name was familiar to him, that is to say. That was to say he had heard the name of Dollar, was it? Dollar, yes. Yes, her lips said more loudly, Mr. Dollar. He sang that song lovely, murmured Mina, Mr. Dollar. And the last rose of summer was a lovely song. Mina loved that song. Tanker loved the song that Mina. Tis the last rose of summer, Dollar left the bloom and felt the wind wound around inside. Gassy thing that cider. Binding to wait. Post office near Ruben J's one and eight pence to get shut of it. Dodge round by Greek Street. Wish I hadn't promised to meet. Freer in air. Music gets on nerves. Ear pull. Her hand that rocks the cradle rules them. Ben Howell that rules the world. Far, far.
air down. I suppose each kind of trade made its own, don't you see? Hunter with a horn, haw, have you the cloche, sonne la, shepherd his pipe, pui little wee, policeman a whistle, locks and keys, sweep, four o'clock, all's well, sleep, all is lost now, drum, company, wait, I know, town crier, bum bailiff, long john, wake in the dead, palm, Ignum, poor little dominie, dominie, palm. It is music. I mean, of course it's all palm, palm, palm. Very much what they call da combo. Still, you can hear as we march, we march along, march along, palm. I must really. Hmm. Now, if I did that at a banquet, just a question, custom, Shah of Persia, breathe a prayer, drop a tear. All the same, must have been a bit of a natural fantasy. It was a yeoman cap, muffled up. Wonder who was that chap in the gray and brown mask? Oh, the whore of the lady. A frowsy whore with black straw sailor hat and skewed in the place of the day I bought the key to the beast. When first he saw that boy, do Yes, it is. I feel so lonely. Wet night in the lane. Who had the he or she saw offer me here? What is she? Hope she. Psst. Any chance of your blush? Your Molly had me decked. Stout lady does be with you in the brown costume. Put you off your stroke. That appointment we made, knowing we never, well, hardly ever, too dear, too near to home. Oh, sees me, does she? Looks up bright in the day. Face like dip. Damn. Oh, well, she has to live like the rest. Look at you. In Lionel Mark's antique sale shop window, haughty Henry Lionel Leopold. Dear Henry Flower, earnestly, Mr. Leopold Bloom envisaged battered candlesticks, melodion, oozing, maggoty, blow back. That's what good salesman is. Make you buy what he wants to sell. Chap sold me the Swedish razor he shaved me with. Wanted to charge me for the edge he gave it. She's passing now. Six bob. Must be the cider or perhaps the bergen. Near bronze from a near, near gold from afar, they chinked their clinking glasses all. Bright eyed and gallant. For bronze Lydia's tempting last rose of summer. Rose of Castile, first lid, dead, cow, cur, doll, a fifth. Lidwell, side to Davis, Bob Cowley, Kernan, Big Ben Dollard, Tap, a youth entered a lonely Mormon hall. Bloom viewed a gallant, pictured hero in Lionel Mark's window. Robert Emmett's last words, seven last words, of my beer, that is. True men like you men, I, I, Ben, will lift your glass with us. They lift it, ta-cheek, ch-chunk, tip, an unseeing stripling stood in the door. He saw not bronze, he saw not gold, nor Ben, nor Bob, nor Tom, nor Cy, nor George, nor Tanks, nor Richie, nor Pat. He, 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 he did not see. See Bloom. Grease of bloom, few last words. Softly, when my country takes her place above. Purr, purr, must be the burr. Nations of the earth, no one behind. She's passed. Then, and not till then, tram, cram, 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 cram. Good offer. Coming, crandle, cram, cram. I'm sure it's the Bergen. Yes. One, two, let my epitaph be. 